Hey, welcome back! Today we are solving one of the most common and tricky interview problems – how to design a file downloader library. It might sound simple at first, but there is a lot more going on under the hood. In this video, I'll walk you through the general approach to library design, which is very different from designing an app. While this applies to both iOS and Android engineers, we'll focus on iOS when it comes to implementation details. Alright, let's dive in. We start with the functional requirements for the file downloader. First of all, it should be a standalone, reusable library you can drop right into any iOS or Android project. We're not talking about UI here, because we assume that this library would be integrated into other apps. Next, we should be able to start a new file download from a source URL to a destination pass. On top of that, we want to be able to pause an active download, preserving partial data, and then resume it right where we left off. We also need to cancel a download in progress and make sure any partial data on disk gets cleaned up. Another key feature is progress reporting. Our library should provide a callback with a download percentage, so that the client can show a progress bar or a similar UI. We also need to support parallel downloads of multiple files with the ability to limit how many run at once. Ideally, the number of maximum parallel downloads should be configurable. Next, we should support large files over 2 GB, which can be tricky due to memory limits, so we need to stream them to disk in small chunks. We also need to support background downloads. This feature will be addressed at the end of the video as an additional topic. Awesome! Now, library design is a whole different beast compared to building a product app. When you're designing an app, you're in control of the whole environment – UI, backend, user flows, everything. But with a library, you're creating something that other developers will plug into their code. So it has to be flexible, easy to use, and super reliable. You can't assume much about how it will be used, which makes things like API design, error handling, and extensibility way more important. Keeping that in mind, let's write the non-functional requirements. First of all, we need clean, intuitive, client-facing interfaces. On iOS, that means to use idiomatic Swift with clear naming conventions, leveraging protocols, and value types. On Android, use Kotlin idioms and follow Android design patterns, exposing a coroutine-based API with clear class names and extension functions. Next, let's talk about encapsulation. Internal details such as queues, semaphores, workers, storage must be hidden behind the public API, and the library has to be thread-safe, no race conditions or data corruption. Another super important requirement we shouldn't have any dependencies on third-party libraries. Depending on external libraries can lead to version conflicts or bloat our code. Instead, use native frameworks, like URL session on iOS, as much as possible. We should also prioritize efficient memory and disk use. And finally, the library needs to be flexible and extensible. By the way, if you want me to make more mobile system design videos, hit the like button. It really helps to grow the channel. Alright, let's move on to the coolest part – the high-level design of our library. Don't worry if the diagram looks a bit intimidating. We'll break it down piece by piece. The schema is divided into three areas. The green part contains public-facing components used by our clients to schedule and manage downloads. The white middle part is our internal implementation that handles the queuing and fetching logic. And the blue part on the right represents system libraries for networking, disk storage, and file hosting API. Let's start with the client-facing API. The most important file is the file downloader protocol. Internally, we have a default file downloader that implements this protocol. What does this protocol look like? A download file method that takes a download request and immediately returns a download task. We also have methods to pause, resume, and cancel all running tasks. And the last method is list active tasks, which returns all download tasks that are currently active. So, what's a download request? It's a simple struct with a source URL, the remote URL from which the file should be downloaded, and a destination pass. It is the local file system pass where the downloaded file should be saved. 
you can clearly see on the schema that the client creates download request and calls download file. The file downloader hands back a download task with a file download callback, so you can monitor progress. You might be wondering what this download task looks like. Let's take a look at the example implementation. First of all, the download task has a status which can be pending, active, paused, completed, failed, and cancelled. Next, it has a progress variable, which is a double between 0 and 1, representing how much of the file has been downloaded so far. You can calculate the percentage based on that. Also, it has an ID and a few public functions – pause, resume, and cancel – that enable us to control a specific download. Additionally, it has an interesting function to add a download callback. This callback can be used by clients to see the download task updates, such as on progress, on complete, on fail, and on cancel. The onProgress function would be called every time the progress variable updates, so we can update our UI accordingly to show a progress bar or something like that. The download task has a few internal methods. They won't be available for the clients to use. They would be used by our default file downloader internally. The last two client-facing objects that we haven't discussed yet are the file downloader factory and the file downloader config. Before I explain why they are needed, I have a question for you. So, why do you think file downloader is a protocol and not a class? We use a protocol so the implementation can be swapped easily, say, a mock version for testing or a custom one for advanced use cases. It also keeps things clean and future-proof. So, File Downloader Factory is a helper that creates a default file downloader with the right setup. It keeps creation logic in one place and makes it easier to configure, test, and swap out implementations if needed. File Downloader Config is like the settings menu and used to create and set up file downloader. Let's look at the code. File Downloader Factory has just one static function to create the file downloader with the config provided. And what? does the file downloader config look like? It's a struct that holds all necessary settings such as max parallel downloads and custom headers. It could be extended to contain more stuff, for instance chunk size, timeout values, cache policy, etc. You can see that the default value for max parallel downloads is 6. Where does this number come from? On iOS, URL session configuration default HTTP maximum connections per host is set to 6 by default, and that's why 6 parallel downloads per host are often treated as a standard on iOS. However, yeah, you can technically go beyond 6 connections by using a custom URL session configuration. Just set HTTP maximum connections per host to a higher number. But keep in mind, the server might still throttle you, and iOS could prioritize efficiency especially for battery and network use. So while it's possible, it's usually best to stick around 6 unless you really need more. Great, we discussed the client-facing API and how to initiate, monitor, and control downloads. Before we move forward, I have a small announcement. If you are preparing for system design and coding interviews, feel free to book a private mentoring or mock interview session with me. The link is down below in the description. Now, let's talk about the internal implementation of the file downloader. Default file downloader takes in a download request and returns download task as a client facing object. But also, it creates an internal representation for the same data, download job. Also, in default file downloader, the job queue is responsible for managing and coordinating the execution of download jobs. It ensures that the number of concurrent downloads doesn't exceed the configured limit and handles scheduling, retries, and job prioritization. Internally, it uses a thread safe dispatch queue, typically a concurrent queue with synchronization mechanisms, to manage state transitions and prevent race conditions. It keeps track of active and pending jobs starting new ones when slots become available. This separation of concerns allows the downloader to operate efficiently and safely in a multi-threaded environment. Next, the download worker is a component and default file downloader responsible for executing the actual file download logic for a single job. It takes care of making network requests, downloading data in chunks, updating progress, and writing the file to disk. We create one download worker instance within default file downloader 
and that single instance is reused concurrently for all active download jobs. Alternatively, we can create multiple download workers, up to the number of maximum concurrent downloads, meaning 6 instances. Ok, what does download worker do step by step? It creates a temporary file on disk, checks whether the download can be resumed, and resumes it if possible. Then it starts a stream download using a network client, reads incoming data in chunks, appends them to the temporary file, and in the end finalizes the download and performs cleanup. A streamed download means you don't wait for the entire file to arrive before you start writing it to disk. Instead, you read it as a continuous flow of bytes and process each bit as it comes in. This keeps your memory footprint low. You only ever buffer a small slice of the file at once, lets you update progress continuously, and allows very large files to be handled without blowing out your RAM. On iOS, it can be implemented with URL session shared bytes for request method, which hands you back an async sequence of raw bytes, URL session async bytes, plus the HTTP response. Before you read any data, you check the status code 200 or 206 to make sure the server is actually sending you a valid body or partial content. Then you iterate over the stream and accumulate bytes in a small data buffer up to a size of 4 kilobytes, which is our chunk size. And finally, you write the chunk to disk using a file storage class. What is a chunk? A chunk is simply the data you've collected in memory up to a certain size. Why is the size 4 kilobytes? It's not a magic number, but it's widely used because it aligns with memory page sizes in most systems. This gives us a good balance between speed and memory usage. If we read less, we'd make more system calls, slowing things down. If we read too much, we waste memory, especially if we are running parallel downloads. So 4 kilobytes hits the sweet spot, not too big, not too small. Alright, and what about the resumable download? It is an extremely complex topic in itself. In this video, I just want to briefly touch it and make a sort of MVP version of it. In our current implementation, we only use HTTP range requests when you explicitly pause and then later resume a download. Here's how it works in our download worker. When you pause a download, we cancel the streaming task, but leave the partial file on disk. On resume, we measure how many bytes were already written and pass that offset into download worker. Before streaming more data, the worker adds a range bytes offset header to the request, so the server only sends the missing portion of the file. From there, it continues the same chunked stream logic, appending new data to the existing file and updating progress until the download finishes. This keeps memory usage low and ensures you never re-download what you've already saved. And what are HTTP range requests? They are a simple way to ask an HTTP server for just a slice of a resource, rather than the whole thing. By adding a header like range bytes equals 5000, you tell the server send me everything starting at byte 5000. If the server supports it, it responds with status 206 partial content and only the requested segment perfect for pausing, resuming, and downloading big files in chunks. What about the file storage class? What does it do? The file storage component handles all interactions with the file system. It is responsible for creating temporary files when the download starts, appending new data chunks as they arrive, and finalizing the file once the download completes. It also cleans up partial files if a download fails or gets cancelled. Basically, it acts as a low-level layer that turns streamed bytes into a real, usable file on disk. And because you own both the network client and file storage, you can inject test doubles. This makes it super easy to write unit tests without ever touching real files or actual servers. Cool, that's it for the high-level design. Now, I want to go over the file download process again, step by step, as this is the main feature of our system. Step 1. The client invokes the download by sending a download request to the file downloader. Step 2. Job queuing. A new download job is created internally. That job gets added to the download queue. Client immediately gets back a download task with status pending. 
Step 3. File Downloader initiates Job Dispatch. Before moving the job to active, we check the dispatch semaphore for maximum parallel downloads. Once the semaphore grants a slot, we check the job's state again and set it to active. After that, we start the new task using a download worker. Step 4. Download execution by the download worker. It ensures a file exists or is created at the destination pass using a temp file under the hood. Next, it inspects how many bytes are already on disk. This is the core of resumable download support. If you are resuming, it performs a quick head request to verify the server supports accept ranges, then sets up the HTTP range header so only the missing portion of the file is fetched. This lets you pick up exactly where you left off without re-downloading dozens or hundreds of megabytes. Next comes the streaming loop. The worker reads the response one byte at a time, but it only holds up to 4 kilobyte in memory at once. As soon as that buffer fills, it appends the chunk to the file on disk, clears the buffer and fires your progress callback with updated percentage. This keeps memory use tiny and gives you smooth, continuous updates. Step 5. Completion. When the job finishes or fails cancels, we clean up, release the semaphore and immediately dispatch any remaining pending jobs. This layered approach, queuing, semaphore gating, a shared worker, file prep, 4 kilobyte streaming and cleanup lets your download large files efficiently, pause and resume on demand and never block your UI or blow out your app's memory. Great, this concludes the MVP version of the file downloader. Now let's briefly talk about the background downloads. To enhance our file downloader system, we can extend it to support background downloads, allowing downloads to continue even when the app isn't active. On iOS, this is handled using URL session with a background configuration, which allows downloads to run while the app is in the background or even when the device is locked. Once we switch to a background URL session, we need to handle different events such as download completion, failure, and progress updates. iOS will notify the app when the download is finished or there is an error, even if the app isn't in the foreground. This means that we would need to set up delegates to listen for these events and update the user's download status, regardless of the app's state. Background downloads can be interrupted when the app is closed, the phone is restarted, or the network connection is lost. The beauty of using background downloads with iOS URL session is that it provides automatic support for resuming downloads. Once the app is reopened, the download can resume from where it left off, without the user needing it to manually intervene. We would need to ensure that the download state, such as the file's current offset, is saved between app launches. This would involve persistent information about each active download, including the file's download status and the point at which it was interrupted. To sum up, Background downloads on iOS can dramatically improve the user experience by allowing long-running downloads to continue even when the app is not in the foreground. Alright, if you enjoy my content, like and subscribe. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.